what's up, everybody? It's Mr. Talk Box. Check it out. You need to like, subscribe. YouTube family, YouTube world, hope everyone is well and blessed. Listen, I told you I was going to come back. I'm coming back and I'm back. And um, I'm back with a dear friend, a dear brother who I haven't known very long, but uh, I've been following him for a lot of years. And we connected on Instagram during the pandemic. And I know you guys see this man right here. That's like right here. You guys see the brother right here. He's chilling. In a whole other another country, and I got him up late, and he, I, I'm just thankful he's hanging out with me. Y'all give it up for the one and only, the Philip Lassiter. Give it up for him, y'all, brother. What's happening, man? Thanks for having me, man. It's good man, to be here, man. No, thank you, man. I tell everybody that you know that comes on. I'm really grateful, man, that you guys, you know, and like you, you, you take some time out to just come hang out with me, chop it up, talk about some stuff, man, and share with with people, man, and dude, I know you can be doing a million and one things, man, I know you're busy, and plus, you're in another country, so you're in a whole side of the, different side of the world, different side of the hour, and I just thank you, man, for hanging out to me, it means the world to me, man, it means much. Thanks for having me. Thank you, man. Yep. Listen, let's get into this, man, so, you're in the Netherlands, how, is, did it start there, tell, tell me about the Netherlands, where you, where you at now? I've been here about three years, man. Um, just like during the pandemic, you know, uh, things just got crazy. I was living in Los Angeles with my family and um, things just got crazy. And after the George Floyd thing and all of the other crazy things that were happening, you know, uh, in the country, I just, we needed a break and it just didn't make sense to live in LA. Why are we here when we can't really leave the house? You know, and so uh, we decided to, to get some peace of mind. So we came over here, we have family over here. My lady was raised over here and we have a lot of family and they, they and so we just, we wanted to be around people, but um, you know, it was, it was, uh, it was the pandemic. So you had to be limited as to, you know, everything. And so we moved out to the country and um, although it was like a, it was more of a, of a family move and just a, a peace of mind decision, uh, it wound up working out great for me uh, with my career as well. I'll tell you more about that later. So, but, um, so, you know, it's so, uh, amazing because most people don't leave Los Angeles to move to a small village in the Netherlands, but I'll, I'll let you know later how it worked out. So f now, are, are you originally from LA or where? where, where oh, no. <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> no shade on LA, but uh, no, I'm not from LA. Uh, well, actually I am. <laughs> we have a joke from where I'm from. I'm originally from Lower Alabama, and we call it LA. <laughs> but, uh, I'm a, I was born uh, in Mobile, Alabama, and I, I raised my father's side of the family's from there, and my father was a preacher. And I was raised there until I was 11, and then we moved up north, we moved to the Midwest. And so I dropped the Southern accent, and I learned to talk fast, and uh, I became a, a, my parents called me a Yankee. Um, and that was really, really good for me culturally, man, because. Uh, you know, that was kind of like right around, I was at 86 and like in school, like all the kids were like beating on their desk. You know, it was like hip hop. Right. And, uh, right. and then like people were rapping in the, in, the, in, the, in the lockers and stuff. And I was just, I was around a lot more diversity being in Peoria, Illinois, which is about three hours south of Chicago. And uh, I was exposed to a lot of culture that I wasn't exposed to in lower Alabama, if you, if you feel me. Absolutely. And, um, I learned a lot, you know, about, you know, who, who I would become. Mm. And, uh, I got really, I, it was, it's funny, you know, my parents only let me listen to Christian music. So I got really heavily into like Christian rap <laughs> and all these cats that were copying all the real rappers. And, uh, <laughs> right. I got really heavily into that, but I was also into jazz and gospel music and, uh, you know, what we're doing at church. And so uh, that's like my early start was, you know, I say that I learned to read music in school, but I learned to play music in church. So, so Phil, were you like, was your, was your, your, your dad was a, was a preacher, was like, were you a PK or did you grow up a PK as well? Yeah. So, yeah, Pentecostal. Yeah. So, um, you're, you're known all over the world, man, for, for one of the greatest, you know, just arrangers, uh, string horn arrangers, uh, conductors, 
um, in the world. So, and and I and I know your body of work. You have a lot of body of work that's attached to a lot of gospel artists, the biggest artists in the world. I know you have a huge body of work. So, when you were branching away from the church thing, right? How did that go with with your family? How did that? How did your dad accept that when you said, "All right, Dad, you know this is cool musically. Um, I see myself going in a different direction." Did you? How did that work work out for you? You know, my parents have always been really supportive with whatever I wanted to do. And even when, you know, I got I got to work with Prince. And, you know, Prince is a very controversial. <laughs> he has a song called Controversy, for crying out loud. Uh, you know, and so Prince wasn't an artist that my parents admired or thought highly of from a moral standpoint. Yeah. Especially not when he was in his heyday. Of course, later he became Jehovah Witness and and, and changed his uh, whole, whole vibe. But, um... They didn't, for one moment, try to tell me, no, you shouldn't do that because of, you know, our religious beliefs. Or, you, you know, they just incur they were just like really happy for me that I got such a great opportunity. And that there was, they've never been anything but supportive. Wow. Wow. That's, yeah. That's interesting, yeah. man. That is really. So, so feel real quick, man. So for, for those people that are kind of, you know, new to my, my, my playlist and, they, they they really want to know. So just name a few. Let's let's talk about the gospel artists. Name a few of the gospel artists, man, that you've that you've uh, worked worked with. Yeah, man. You know, back in about in two thousand, I got my first gig out of college, out of church as a music director in Dallas, Texas, and I was already a huge fan of Kirk Franklin God's Property. That God's Property record had just dropped, like maybe a year or two before I moved. And all of a sudden, I found myself in these circles of, you know, these Kirk Franklin circles. And I got, um, I started to record in a studio and just recording some of my own stuff for fun. And word started to spread really quickly about my horns in particular. Because um, there was a lot of great producers in Dallas, a lot of great songwriters and musicians, but there wasn't a lot of horn arrangers and horn producers. And I, I kind of came in um, swinging for the fences not really even expecting anything and then all of a sudden i got my first gig it was like my first record was uh, ted and sherry and then like and myron butler was producing that from god's property and then like maybe a year later i'm in the studio with kurt franklin and we made the hero record which had stevie wonder on it and won a grammy and then all of a sudden i was starting to work i'm, I'm working with Aaron Lindsay and israel houghton and we're doing karen clark and a bunch of stuff and then and then the next thing you know, I'm like, I'm doing a bunch of gospel records. And I did uh, a lot of the early James Fortune stuff, which is some of the stuff that I'm musically the most proud of with uh, Terrence Vaughn producing. This is some of like the craziest music I ever was a part of. With Regina Bell was on some of this stuff. And then, you know, I did every Kurt Franklin record after that, pretty much. Um, I've been on every record of his since Hero and every single one has won a Grammy. And then uh, I started to work with Donald Lawrence, and then I started working with John P. Key, and I worked with Fred Hammond. I did the, the Grammy-winning record of, what was that, Free to Worship. And then, uh, you know, one thing led to another. I started writing for strings, and my first string gig was with Roberta Flack. Wow. And then, uh, so, and as a result of basically playing on all these records and grinding for about, you know, eight or nine years, and basically devoting my myself to playing on records it wasn't i want to say this there was nothing glamorous about it you know i wasn't hitting the red carpet i wasn't even meeting half the artists or many of them at all um i wasn't going to parties i wasn't going to the grammys i wasn't there was nothing glamorous about it there wasn't a lot of money in it either because gospel is it's a great genre but it's it's not a, it's not pop music you know it's not rock you know, it's not um, rock and roll where it's just like, you know, a bajillion of fans out there. Um, so it was it was sustainable, but it wasn't I, it was a struggle because one month I would I would do well. And then the next month it would be crickets because a lot of people just weren't making records at that time. And then it was still somewhat competitive. But I stay I say all that to say I stay with it because it's what I wanted to do. I got opportunities to go out on the road with like uh and play and play b3 oregon you know and i turned it down even though the money would have been great and i was like no because 
that's playing organ and I want to play trumpet and I want to keep doing this and because I know I got something here. And then, you know, after eight, nine years of doing that, one day I get the, uh, the call and I've been referred to Prince and I've been referred to him through a gospel bass player who, you know, Andrew Goucher. <laughs> so it was the work that I did for those years that put my name out there and established me as someone that was, you know, competent, creative, and uh, and uh, and and so that's why because Andrew really didn't know me that well. When when Prince asked him, "Do you know somebody, particularly someone who writes?" Um, he was like, "Oh, I know just the guy." So I love to tell the story, especially when I'm when I'm talking to kids in schools and stuff, and to tell them like, "You want to know how to make it? You know, you just you just." walk in your purpose you just you work on your craft and you keep doing it you keep doing it keep doing it keep doing it and and things will happen and it it may take you 10 years may take you 20 but i mean i never would have imagined i would have been you know traveling with prince and working with him one-on-one -on -one. and uh but it was the it was the work and the, my love for the work that got me there you know what Phil, man, that's that. Yeah, that's awesome, man. And so I was going to ask you what came first. Was it the gospel stuff or did Prince? So Prince came later afterwards, right? Yeah. So Prince, now, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because, dude, you have your sound, man, is just the way you think, man, about arrangements, man, is incredible. Um, you and Prince, perfect marriage because. I'm I'm a big Claire Fisher fan. I love his voicings. I love the way he thinks, everything. And it's crazy, man, because when I listen to your horn arrangements and even some of your string stuff, I said, this is I it almost seemed like, man, you was you you were started with Prince from day one because of the way you think, of how out you think and how how you your your harmonies and how clustered you think is just how inspired how much did he inspire you um in in the way you and the way you arrange right now did you already have this or or did, you know cuz it's like a match made in heaven man you guys it was just incre incredible so what kind of inspiration did he bring to your thought process man uh it was i learned a ton from him because you know he really thought outside the box and he was, um, he knew music, but he wasn't like trained the way I was trained in school and he didn't know theoretical terms and this and that. But, um, you know, but he, so, so I think that was an advantage of his because he really knew music, but in his own way, in his own relationship to it and to theory. Um, and so he really thought outside of the box. But um, I, I like the way he, he, I like the way he used the horn section to just keep the energy high. He loves to shot on two. Man, we played more shots on two than I ever played in my life, you know? A shot on two, on B2, you know what I mean? And then, like, he also, the, the way he would write, and you can hear on his hits, it's like, his horn, his, he wrote those horn lines, you know, um, Raspberry Beret and all that stuff. They're thematic. So when you hear when the song comes on, you recognize the song. It's it's as strong as a melody as when he comes in singing the verse or or singing the hook. That's like the biggest hook of the song is the horn line. I don't write like that. I'm like kind of crazy and all over the place, and I write more through compose, which means parts that that don't repeat. Right? I'm a bit ADHD like that, but and that's cool too. And he loved that about me. And he would let me loose and let me do that stuff. But I also learned how to like think more like in a commercial way. Um, yeah, it was it was really cool. And I will say that doing all the gospel arrangements for that many years got me ready to work with him mm. harmonically, um, stylistically, and in and in every way. If if I had gotten that call too early, I would have probably messed it up. Uh, musically, I might have not been ready, and I know that uh, that emotionally and just maturity-wise, I wouldn't have been able to handle being in that in that camp and in that situation. It was hard enough at 35 when I joined. Then, uh, let alone, uh, uh, you know, if I had been 25 or even 30, it was um, it? Uh, you know, it would have been it would have been too soon. But I, I think it was the 
dealing with learning to deal with a lot of personalities in gospel music and you, you probably worked in gospel it's like you know uh there's all all kinds of personalities there and um and so you know i had to learn through the years to uh to to tame my tongue and to you know to sometimes swallow your pride and just like let things go you know for the big for the big picture you know yeah. and, and and learn how to get control of the ego which is a tough thing, you know, and especially it's tough when people are, are telling you you're, you're the GOAT and this and that and you're so good, you're the greatest and we love you so, and everything you do is great. And, you know, and, and, and when I came into gospel, that's kind of what was happening. It was just the gospel, you know, industry that was telling me that it wasn't the whole world. But in my mind, it start, you, man, you start to believe the hype. You're like, man, I am really damn good at this, you know. Right. Yeah, I am good at it. And then, and then somebody calls one day and they're like, hey, um, I don't like what you did on this. Can you change that? And it's like, well, wait a minute. I'm the GOAT. <laughs> 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 and then you then you then you learn that hey man this this is art it's subjective and at the right. end of the day I'm providing a service I'm, I'm, a, I'm a freelance person that's providing a service and if 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 somebody needs something then it's my job to give it to them it, it, it has nothing to do with me or my skill set right and um, along the way when as I've been more and more open minded to that man I learned a hell of a lot you know. I, I, I can attest to that. Um, I've been through that <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of times. And, and yeah. you're absolutely right, man. You're there to serve uh, the purpose of what serves the song or, and what the artist wants. It's their vision. It's their dream. It's their it's their baby. You're the doctor. You just got to help them deliver it. That's it. And um, yeah. and, and you're right, man. It's, it, 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 you know, you have to swallow a lot of pride down. To, you know, as you as you get into this, and you is you have to be a certain way, man. But but I want I want to get into something, man. That I want you. To, let's talk about. Tell me what this filthy thing is all about, man. Because I checked I checked some of it out. There's still it's a it's a huge body of work, and I'm I'm going to be just living with it um, for the next couple of days, man. Because. I kind of just zipped through it, man, and it was just the body of work feel was incredible, man. You're such a diverse musician, and diverse artist, and producer, and arranger, man. It just blows me away, man, how diverse you are. And I love music. Those, you know, you're you're like my perfect musician, the kind of guy that I love because you're not just in the box. You you do it. You do so much, man. When it comes to music, there's nothing you can't do musically. But this filthy project, man, man, please, man, let, let's talk a little bit about that. What is yeah, the man. filthy, what is that, the filthy, is it filthy, you know, is it filthy funk? What is that all about, my brother? Yeah, you know, when I was, basically when I was in Dallas, and I, all this stuff was happening, when I started to get on records doing horns, you know, I, I always wanted to be a songwriter and producer first before and the and the horn thing was a side thing it just it just happened to take off and be like my my ni my niche you know it was the thing that got me in rooms it was the thing that got me got my name out there and 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 got and brought money and stability and all that but I, I, all i've really ever wanted to do was write songs and produce and um so when i while i was in dallas i you know i throughout college and everything i was writing songs and stuff and i would always find because i didn't sing back then and I, I would find singers to work with and it was always a, a hassle because you know they would usually it would, things would fizzle out and then they would go on their way and do something else and then you know and i was stuck again here with these songs and nobody to sing them and then i just it just started to boil inside of me even though i wasn't like a seasoned singer or had like any kind of control over my voice I had like a connection to these songs and I wanted to sing them. And I grew up with great songs, you know, in gospel music and and uh and I've I've always been a song person. You know, I, I've always been a lyric person. I think that gives me an edge as an arranger because a lot of horn players, they don't listen to the lyrics at all. A lot of people don't, they don't really pay attention to the story. And I think that's one of the reasons why as Kirk Franklin says about me, he's like he says that I help tell the story, you know, and, and so that I just started to go out and sing my songs and, and uh, you know I, I, I put a band together and I had cats like Bernard Wright in my band in Dallas and I had cats like the Snarky Puppy guys when, when they were still in college 
and all these all these great cats would you know and i started to make a record i started to record with bobby sparks he had a studio and he was gracious enough to let me come record there and we had all kinds of cats we were putting on this record and i i worked on this record for years man and then i i left dallas i went through some personal things and i moved to nashville and i moved to nashville just to get away and just kind of start over and think maybe the hope that maybe that would spark some something in my musical career and um i was there and it was a great experience i i, I met a lot of amazing people and uh one of which was a good buddy of mine who um who was really encur- a couple of friends of mine that were really encouraging were like phil man you need to sing your songs like you you're an artist and i was like oh, i'm not an artist i'm just i'm just fooling around this is just a this is just a you know something i do for fun um and they're like no you're an artist you need to play shows like you're gonna and, and in nashville school because i had these venues you could go and you could take your band and you don't make any money but you get up and you play you you could do a show and then you know a legit show and do whatever you want do your original music and so i started to do that i put a band together and they were killing and uh, you know we all became very good friends and, and i started to play shows and then i met a guy who helped me finish the record that i had no money to finish and it was the filthy record it was my very first artist album and i put that out and dropped that independently um and basically through the years i just kind of kept doing this as a as a hobby within you know the music stuff it's like this smaller other musical project that's like my my hobby because i don't really do any carpentry or origami or, or you know sailing or anything i'm just a, a music head you know and so i moved to new york and i, I started hanging with my buddies snarky guys had moved there and i continued to play shows at places like the rockwood and the shows would go well man the people would respond really well i always had a blast but i i, I just couldn't see i i i really wasn't focused on it i was i was more focused on kind of like being a little ratchet at the time i was like you know single again and kind of i never really um i never really uh well, let's just say it what it is i never really sowed oats you know and then here i am i'm 30 years old and i'm like i'm living in new york and nashville new york and then and i'm just like i was more interested in just living you know going out every night having a good time you know, socializing, dating, and uh, that was like my focus. And um, I was doing these records in the more in, in, during the day to pay my bills. But like this artist thing was something that I would do, but it, I wasn't really focused on it. So it wasn't really propelling forward because of that. And I wasn't really shedding enough. I wasn't taking care of myself, so my instrument wasn't really at the, at its at its best. And that's kind of where I stayed. And then I got the Prince gig, and I continued to make records. And I, I made several records. I moved around a bit, and then uh, eventually met my lady, man, and things changed. Um, and then uh, we moved to L.A. I was in L.A. for five years. And it was the, I moved there thinking, again, thinking like, okay, I'm going to get in, and I'm going to do more horn arranging and string arranging. I'm going to be an MD. Maybe I get to write. Maybe I'll get to do some movie mm-hmm. film score. None of that stuff happened for me in L.A. And I know that if I had stayed, they say stayed eight to ten years, and then things, for a lot, some people, they come in and they hit the ground running. For most people, it takes a little time, so stick with it. I was there for five years, and those things weren't happening. So since those things weren't happening, I decided to, well, I'll just focus on my artist mm-hmm. thing here in L.A., and I'll just make more records, make start making some music. I started meeting videographers because it's L.A., I met this great videographer who's a rapper. He's like, hey, you produce for me. I make videos for you. Bam, we're in business. So I'm, you know, we were doing shows. We were playing at the Mint. Again, no money. You know, I got no real booking agent. I'm not getting any festivals. I'm not getting, but I got this killer band in L.A. And L.A.'s hard, you know, for live music. People just don't go out for live music that much, especially not for funk right. and original funk. Right. Um, so, so, but it was starting to grow, and we had a great time, and I learned a lot. And most importantly, I made two really, really badass records. Okay. With cats like, 
Robert Spetsy right on drums, wow. Mono mm-hmm. Leon on bass, Jimmy wow. Newbel, Mark Letiri, uh the guy from Toto now, uh, Xavier, uh, the Dominique Xavier, yeah. uh, top on, on keys, and so many cats, man. Uh, Serge, um, Eric Walls, and wow. there were so many great, great players, and um, that that that. And I was able to make some really killing, some of the best records that I had made up to that point, and and just continue to grow as a producer. And I was working in a in a, in a cool studio with a friend of mine there, and uh, and we really we really spent a lot of time mixing those records and hanging out and just talking about Sonics and talk and getting schooled and by other friends of ours that would come over and listen and kind of rip it to shreds and. And so that's, if nothing else, that's what I got out of L.A. And uh, again, man, I, I never really set out to to be a serious artist. I just started doing it because it was inside me and I had to get it out. Gotcha. So I moved to I moved to the Netherlands three years ago. I get here. It's the middle of the pandemic. And about six months in, I get hit up by this booking agent over here who had been watching me for some years. And I met her through a good friend of mine who played with Prince. We were in the band together. So here's Pr- the Prince connection again. Coming back right? around, yes. Right. So there's a there's a common thread through the whole, my whole the whole trajectory of my career, man. It's amazing. God is amazing. And so um, you know, what happened was she had been watching me, but she wasn't ready to sign me because I was living in the States and this it's too hard to get started over here if you gotta buy those plane tickets. It's just, you're either gonna have a old one, a old tour, or forget about it. Exactly. And she said, Look, I heard your new record. And it's, it's, it was my, my latest record at the time, it was called Living Love. It's my last record I dropped with Mono Neon and Sput C Right, featuring all these amazing singers in LA, by the way, that I had access to because I was in LA. Durand Bernard, Charles Jones, Mackenzie, you know, Mar- Mariah Mache, um, it, it, we had so many incredible singers on this record, man. And um, and she heard the record, this agent, and she was like, whoa, this is next level. And she's like, wait a minute, you're here. So she calls me, she said, Phil, we need to talk. I think I want to sign you now. Wow. And I had seen her putting my friend all over Europe doing her thing and festivals and all kinds of stuff. Wow. And I was like, yeah, let's go. And she was like, okay, it's a pandemic right now, so it's a little slow, but when things open up again, I'd like to, to help you build your name over here in Europe. And wow. since you live here, I can start getting you on. The money may not be all that great, it'll be decent, but it, it'll be a start. And when I tell you it was like way better than decent because I'm used to playing at the Mint for nothing. Right. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? All of a sudden I got I got a budget to go into a festival in a new country that I've never seen before. So that's exciting. Play whatever I want to play, play my original music for these people that have never heard it and they get to connect with me. And since then, bro, in about two years, I've been to Armenia and Lithuania and Prague and Berlin and Norway and London twice, Ronnie Scott's and Manchester and all over Holland and all over Germany. And we've been to Spain and Madrid. We've been to the Canary Islands off the coast of Africa. We've been to uh, Estonia and Finland. And this year we're going to Romania. I mean, it's just, it's, it's crazy. And, and when the, when the, when, when the, when the horn and string arranging stuff kind of slows down as it does, that stuff has been kind of saving my butt. <laughs> And it's only getting better. Like this year, I've got a lot more dates than last year. Um, so every year it's growing. And um, I'll share with you some exciting news. Last year, um, uh, as a surprise, I was asked by the North Sea Jazz Festival. For those people that don't know, the North Sea is one of the most respectable and biggest jazz festivals in the world in Rotterdam, Netherlands. I was asked to perform uh, for uh, there with my band for a, a Roy Hargrove tribute. Wow. And I did it with a 13-piece band. I did it on a shoestring budget with a 13-piece band and that I put together here in the Netherlands. And we did a, we, we also just did our first live recording with that band. We had, so we were ready. We, we, were, we recorded in April 
during the, it was still pandemic, so we didn't have an audience, but we did a live record, right? Wow. That's dropping June thirtieth of this year, and we did a live record with Duran Bernard and Candy Dolfer, and then a month later, Ring Ring North Sea Jazz, we had a cancellation. We want you to play the jazz stage, <laughs> so I took that, brought in, and and get look at this man, Candy Dolfer was there, and. Dur Durand Bernard was at the festival on the same day as me with Erica Badu because he sings oh, with her. Wow. So he was able to to perform with us. Exactly. Wow. And we did this mega performance, man. He came out on roller skates. <laughs> it was crazy. <laughs> it was about twelve hundred people. It was packed in there in the jazz the jazz uh, stage. And so we did that. It was great. We got TV all over the Netherlands. And then this year, I thought, oh, it probably won't happen this year, but um, I, I hit them up um, and I showed them this new video that I made last year. I decided, I got this idea to put together a 23 piece band wow. and do a live recording slash music video. There's a song called Simmer Down and that's under my name, Philip Lasseter, Simmer Down. And it's, we go it's into tight, the studio, man. It's so it's cold. cold. It's, you it's saw ridiculous, man. Yes, yes it's ridiculous. Stuff. It's ridiculous. Yeah, man. So we, I, I sent it to the North Sea and was like, hey, we'd like to do this. And they were like, oh, I'm sorry, we don't have room for you this year, maybe some other time. Okay, cool, no problem. A few weeks passed, they called me again, hey, we had a cancellation. We want you to do the big stage on Saturday when you'll go before Marcus Miller, Jill Scott, and Tom Jones. And we want the 23-piece band. Oh, wow. So wow. this summer, I'm going to hit at North Sea Jazz on the main stage, ten to 15,000 people. Wow. With a 23-piece band. Me, wow. the horn, the trumpet player. <laughs> hey, man, that's, 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 they do, that's how, like you said, God is amazing, man. I mean, just, just, just the, 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 uh, the progression of things and the way it's happening for you, man, it's just do nothing but or it's happening all organically man it's like you're not even asking it's just like being thrown just put at your on your desk man and and that's a good that's a that's really good man that's that's amazing dude absolutely amazing yeah. so so these are some of the things you got going anything else that you got happening this year i know you you, you said you're pretty busy you've already touched on a couple of things any other things? I don't want to leave anything out, man. Any other things? No, no, but working going on? back to what I was saying, just a reminder is uh, this live record that I put all my coins into last year. Um, it's called Raw in Amsterdam. Philip Lasseter, Raw in Amsterdam, featuring Duran Bernard and Candy Dolfer, 13-piece band. Um, we recorded 12 songs in six hours. It's dropping June 30th, but the vinyl... Pre-sale has already dropped, and the link is in my bio and my Instagram, and it's all over my Facebook as well. Um, but people can get the vinyl if they're into that. Um, they can order that now, and that will help us a lot. But the record drops June 30th, and in the meantime, I've already dropped two singles uh, with videos. So if they go on my YouTube page, they can see uh, a song that I wrote um, for Prince called Purple. It's an instrumental song featuring me and Candy Dolfer. It's some real, real raw, real angry kind of funk, like real funk, you know, like not messing around, coming to get you kind of funk. <laughs> um, it. It's called Purple. And then we dropped a, a, a version of my song, Bump the Man, which is a bit political. We kind of wrote it about, you know, Donald Trump. Yeah. And, uh, and, it's, uh, <laughs> and it's featuring Durand Bernard. And it's super Tower Power on acid. Oh, wow. Crack. Oh wow! Uh, real funky, but it's also got Latin stuff. It's it's it twists and turns. So both of those singles are out now. The next single will be "Repent," which is a kind of James Brown raw funk thing with uh with Duran Bernard and Candy Dolfer. Um, Candy Dolfer, for those of people that don't know, she's like the most famous musician in the Netherlands. She played with Prince for years. She was part of Musicology. She was the real pretty blonde, you know, that just played like Maceo and David Sanborn. She's yeah. crazy. Yeah, and she played with Van Morrison, and she's a household name here in Europe. She's yeah. she's, really, she's big over really here as well. Strong. She's she's still she's kicking okay. she's she's kicking a lot of tail over here as well. Yeah, yeah, especially yeah. in LA. She's yeah. teamed up with Cars, and they're doing yeah. a lot of stuff. 
but um so she's been gracious enough and, and to to be a part of what i'm doing and to, to let me into her world and i i wrote and produced a song on her her new record alongside of now rogers which was cool wow um I work on the now rogers song too with do horns and so it's been cool to work with her and uh so that album is getting dropped and every month i'm gonna drop a video on socials and on youtube and everything um and just gearing up for these shows man and i'm also in the meantime i'm i'm writing and recording new stuff all the time so i'm actually already six songs into another album after i drop this live record uh i hope that maybe january or sometime early 24 i'm gonna drop another studio record with my dutch band. And I'm, I tell you, I'm excited about these songs because, you know, I mentioned earlier, I wasn't really focused on this, this side of my career, but now that I have an agent and I'm able to get in front of audiences, it's, it's, um, it's made it a reality for me that all this is, it's not for not, you know, spending all this money, uh, putting all this time, playing all these shows for nobody, dragging my keyboard out of my car, selling my CDs out of my car. All of that, all of what I've been doing this whole time, it wasn't for nothing, man. I was getting prepared, and I'm still getting prepared. And what it's also done is it's kind of given me a kick in the pants as I've gotten out on the road as a as an artist. It's the next level because you know I'm taking care of everything. I don't have a TM. I don't. I don't have. Um, you know, I'm the artist. I'm trying to play trumpet, keys, and sing all on stage and direct the band. And sell my merch and sign autographs afterwards, right? I'm, right? I'm handling everything, and so I I say all that to say I need to be in shape. I need to be ready for this. Right. Go the travel and the shows and the travel and the show and the travel and the show, and I'm just not. So you know, I've cut a lot of things out of my life, man. Without going into detail, I've gotten a lot of things cut out of my life, and it's a beautiful thing, man. And uh, starting to. Uh, you know, really eat better and work out more, and and really get in the shed on vocals, on piano. Because I'm all I've always been in the shed on trumpet because I had to be because that's my livelihood and that's my thing, you know. But even more, like you know, I still take lessons on trumpet. Mm -hmm. I've been playing for 37 years. I have trumpet players, teachers that I study with on the regular. Wow. And I, I will never stop because it's such a it's such a thing, you know. And so now I'm starting to, you know, my lady is a great singer and she's always watching these YouTube videos and, and, and getting vocal coaching that way. And we've got a piano in our house now. And so we, I'm teaching her piano and teaching her theory and she's been going in hard. And, and, and I'm just like, yeah, man, I need to get I need to get myself together because it's coming. Right. It's right around the corner, you right. know. Right. And I want to be at my best. I want to be able to run all over that stage and not get winded. Right. I want to be able to sing every night and not get tired. Right. I want to learn how to do this the correct way and have a long career, you know, and, and put my best foot forward for the shot that I got. Right. Because, you know, I, I will always love mm -hmm. to be in the studio, do the studio thing. It's a great way to, to, to stay creative and to make money when I'm home. But this this artist thing is really what I've always wanted. Wow. You're a very deep dude, man. Very deep spiritual brother, man. And and I'm so glad you, that man. we I'm so glad that um, you know, in our short period of time of knowing each other through the through the pandemic, that's where we met. Um, I'm so glad I got a chance to meet you and and be your friend, man, and um and um and hear you talk, man, and tell your story, man. It's powerful, man. You know, you're a very Thank successful you, man. you're you're very I gotta very, add that Yes. And thank you for saying all those kind words, but I gotta say that I wasn't always, you know, and uh, I wasn't always, and and that's okay. But uh, I think it's important to note that people, you know, it, we can change, you know, we can change ourselves, we can work on ourselves. It's hard. It takes time. It doesn't necessarily always happen overnight. Nobody's perfect, but but you can change. And you can become become humble, and you can become humbled by the world for sure. You know, and, and you know what? Uh, you know what? That's that goes for that goes for all of us. I mean, yeah. we, we all got our flaws, man. We're flawed. No, we're, there's a lot of 
you know, we're, we're, we're not perfect, man. There's imperfections that, that we all deal with. And we, but, but when you become a better and when you work, it's a daily, it's a day to day thing, man. It's a day to day thing. And, but the most important part of it all is that, you know, when you live to see another day, man, you live to see change and you live to, you live and have an opportunity to do better than you did the day before. And, um, and, and I'm the same way, man. I, um, you know, um, I've come a long way just in my, just in my being as a man. And um, um, this is why, man, I like, you know, social media. I never was on social media because I just just never got on it, man. And, and I was a mystery to a lot of people and I just didn't believe in it. And I said, so when I got on it, I said, I want to use my social media platform for what it's supposed to be. Social media. I want to get Phil Lasseter to come on my small little platform. Dude, I don't have, my thing is very little. But whatever I have, man, I'm, I'm going to share it with people that, you know, that I, that I dig and that I care for to use my, whatever platform I got or whatever I got to tell their story so people can go out and support, man. And this is why I'm just doing this, man. I don't, dude, I don't expect anything, man. I just love and appreciate the fact that people just come on and hang out with me on my small little yeah. thing. And I really appreciate uh, it, man. And dude, you're not small. Dude, I, 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 I'm, I'm looking forward to working with you, man. I can't wait, man. And, uh, yeah. and, um, well, just, I enjoyed the last thing we did. Yeah. It was great. Oh man, dude, man, you, I was, I was glad to just, 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 just being on it, man. And just have, you know, being with you. But, um, listen, man, let everybody know how they can find you and reach you. Yeah, man. Um, my website is Philip Lassiter Music, one L and Philip, uh, two S's in Lassiter. And um, they can find me on Instagram, Philip Lassiter Music, and uh, Facebook and all that good stuff. Um, and, uh, and of course, all the streaming platforms. You can find me under Philip Lassiter, Spotify, all that. And uh, there's also some stuff under Filthy with a PH, of course, as well. Yeah. So before I let you go, this is my final question that I try to ask everybody. It's my new question. Um, <clears throat> you got four, the top rush, uh, top uh, the Mount Rushmore. Who who are you gonna put? Now see the thing about it, you're you play horn, you play piano, you play keys, you sing, you do it all. You're 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 uh, an arranger. So your top four arrangers that you're gonna put on Mount Rushmore. Who who are they gonna be? Oh man, that's a tough one. Yeah. That's a tough one. I mean, you mentioned Claire Fisher earlier. So That's when it one. comes to creative orchestration and creative, when it comes to creative harmonic, like string arranging and orchestral arranging, I think uh, he's probably my favorite yeah, for, right. uh, for modern music, especially, um, you know, and as far for when it comes to, uh, to string arrangers, I, I've always loved Paul Reiser. He did the arrangement on uh, Stevie Wonder's Rocket Love, song Rocket Love. Um, just brilliant. Um, and, uh, you know, as far as horn arrangers goes, I've always been a really big fan of Chicago. And the trombone player from Chicago, Jimmy Pankow, he's, uh, he, he did most of the arrangements from what I understand. And uh, it's just so melodic. Yeah, three horns. It's not even a lot, but it's like, it's so melodic like that's where i get a lot of i i work in i'm like a combination of like chicago tower of power earth one and fire cameo and like roy hargrove voodoo you know d'angelo voodoo with roy hargrove like i'm basically a combination of all those things but um horn arranger wise i mean i've always loved this cat out of minneapolis that has the horn heads with a, the, he was Prince's guy forever. His name is Michael B. Nelson. Mm-hmm. And the name of the horn section is a horn heads. I, mean, I think he's the greatest. Wow. Um, but of course, there's there's other there's other sure. great ones. That, sure. That sure. we all know and love. Sure. You know? <clears throat> but between between Claire Fisher, uh, definitely my number one guy, and, and Paul Reiser. Man, I'm so thankful I had a chance to work with Paul Reiser on a project we did. Yeah. Um, and uh, I love Paul Reiser. Oh, I love I love Benjamin Benjamin Wright, Jeremy Lubbock. Benjamin there's so, Wright is another one. There's man. so many, Benjamin man. <laughs> there's so many, man. Yeah, listen, yeah. listen, Phil, man. I can't thank you enough, man, for your time, bro. I, I really um, am honored, man, that you're hanging out with me, man. And um, I'm just asking everybody that's on that's on my <clears throat> that's a part of my platform. Please go out and support this brother. He's doing some amazing, incredible work. 
uh, go look at his work. I'm sure um, you guys have probably heard his work and not even knowing it. Um, but he's an incredible musician and, and, and young, and, and now he's doing his own thing. And I I'm can't still wait. A little young. I'm still oh man, you 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 you're young, bro. You're young compared to me, man. I'm an old for you. are young, man. Listen. Listen, I'm, I'm just getting started. Man. Yeah, yeah, there you, go. there you go. There you go. But man, I can't wait to see if God's willing, man, you know, in the next couple of years where your thing is going to be, man. I think I see it just yeah, growing and growing and growing, man. So, and, and I look forward to seeing that if God's willing, man. But, dude, thank you once again for hanging out with me, man. Um, yeah, and yeah, um, yeah. I will be, we'll definitely be in touch, my brother. Sounds good. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate you, man. We'll talk in a minute. Don't make me